So nice to be back after Hyderabad. So uh, uh, my uh, topic is uh, new issues and new venues of internet governance. Uh, now, Sadish, how much time do you have? You have one hour from now. Yeah. So, uh, how many people here are from core technical backgrounds? I know it's supposed to be the majority, so I should have asked the other question. More or less, it's like 60%, I think. Right. Um, so, things I'm going to talk to you today, because it's about new issues and new venues, may just be too new. Uh, you may also start wondering whether they are about internet and about internet governance. And we can talk about it. I think we'll explore that. Uh, but if I am trying to talk about them, uh, I take it from how internet is seen by people, people outside, in the newspapers, in TV studios, in people's discussions, uh, what do they think as internet? And sometimes it happens with such a powerful phenomenon that people who are inside that space, uh, maybe you know, attached to certain definitions, but outside, the phenomenon starts to be looked in different manners. And that is important because after all, we are serving the people and not people, us. So we need to keep track of what is it that people think, see internet as. And my discussions today would take from that evolutionary sense in which internet is seen uh, today around us. Uh, and I would give some critical comments on perhaps how some definitions and some governance approaches may be too much stuck in the past and we need to move, have evolutionary growths, which again we would uh, explore together. And since I have said that it's an exploration in a very new area, uh, if you really feel that, well, I'm not getting it, and I think the faces of people around me are as stony as mine, uh, ask a question and say, no, well, this, this, why are you saying this? And that, I think, will uh, make things go in directions in which we can make this journey to that together. Uh, how do we see as internet, is it a technology? And the session before us was, I mean, I got at me person said, we are a technical organization. Uh, so, of course, it is a technology. So, is it basically a technology? Uh, yes, of course, it's a technology. But there are many technologies in this world, very powerful ones. And people don't gather in the manner even if we are gathered here. People don't talk about it in a manner, internet is in every newspaper today, and people are talking about it everywhere. Uh, so that's, is that just in technology is an issue here, right? We will talk about it. The people tend to see internet as a space, a virtual space, you know. Uh, we, we put on our laptop, and we reach a space where we can get emails from other people. That space puts an, us in connection with information which we otherwise could not have got. We, we look at its space, you know, put it on, a virtual space is created, put it off, is out. So we, and that's, that paradigm has been used when we say virtual space. I mean, there's a real space in which we live, but we put on something and a virtual space is created, and it is more and more interesting, and we know that, how interesting it is. So is it a space? Uh, well, maybe, partly it is. Uh, but more than that, because even uh, how many of you have grown up playing video games? Some of you, the younger ones, but a lot of us haven't. And I often see it with horror when people are playing it, but that's just a cultural uh, ageist issue. Uh, but yes, but then v v video games are also a space. It's much more a space than internet. You almost enter that space and you know, you are mostly shooting guns, which is my problem, but uh, doing things. Uh, so that is also a space, but that's a virtual space, but internet is not just a video game, right? So I'm just giving, I mean, I'm trying to ask you to think, what is internet really? Uh, internet is a set of interconnectivity protocols, which is the technology part. Eben Moglen, who is a famous uh, FOSS advocate, Quoted a definition once which caught my attention, it's always been there with me since 
He says internet is a set of social relationships. And here it's the first time everyone can communicate with everyone else without intermediation. Well, the social relationship part, and the second part also, but it's a set of social relationships, right? Now, if we start looking at internet as a set of social relationships, now I'm asking you to seriously, you know, think about whether you're ready to go along with me on that. But a lot of people outside, when people talk in newspapers and uh, talk among each other who are not technologists, look at it as, as those new kinds of social relationships. For them, it's a Facebook group. Uh, for them, it's a new kind of organizational system which has been made possible because of the internet. So, a new set of social relationships. But now we enter into problematic territory because if it's not just technical protocols, but it's a set of new social relationships, then what is internet governance? Because till it is technical protocols, it's easy. We have talked about it. ISOC does it. IETF does it. ICANN does it. That's fine, but if it is a set of social relationships, it becomes very, very complex. And we know the complexities. You know, everything is digital today. How many would people understand the word digital and can associate a meaning with digital? Um, digital is something I'm going to come to. Whether digital is internet or post-internet. Uh, anyway, uh, so the question is that is internet governance about Governance of the technical protocols of the infrastructure of connectivity, which internet is, or it is about certain governance patterns of the new social relationships which are emerging, which in people's minds, in business mind, is internet. And how two are connected is an issue. So even if you are a technologist, it is useful for you to understand what is the social internet. What is internet a social relationship because then you will be a better technologist. You would also be more useful to the industry. And other than that, in any case, social analysts, policy makers should, in my view, centrally look at internet as a social relationship. I take an example, analogies work, especially in fast changing times like this. In industrial age, the most important things early on were power. Power defines industrial age, mechanization of power, and the connectivity infrastructure. We may underestimate how much it meant to make a road or lay a railway track. Everything what is industrial depending on a railway track. If there was a railway track, there could be mass industrialization. If there was no railway track, you have to produce things locally and consume locally. If there is a railway track, there could be city centers which could make utensils, make all things which normally are made in small centers in a more mass manufacturing manner, and the factory becomes possible. I'm saying these things because we need to understand the difference between infrastructure of an age, and this is an industrial age, and the social relationships of that age which is school, nuclear family, even nation government, all these are institutions of industrial age, and they basically were created because factories were created. Now, I won't get into that, but similarly, there is an internet and there is a basic connectivity in infrastructure, and then because of internet, we have Facebook, we have Uber. People think of them as internet phenomenon. Now, which is the internet? Of course, the internet of the academics in 1990s is not the same as the free basics internet of Facebook, is not the same as Uber as an internet phenomenon. They are all very different. And we have no idea right now which one of them is internet. Or even if the common element of all three, what is internet? Now, if just the infrastructure is a common element and then it's possible, then how do we study these other phenomena? I'm happy if somebody wants to define internet governance simply as the technology protocols and governance of technology protocols. I enter into many discussions at the ISOC policy list where people say, but what has that to do with internet governance? Internet governance is just the ICANN, IIT stuff. But that's a little, you know, unclear because if you go to Internet Governance Forum, that's not what most people are discussing there, right? 90% of the people are not discussing ICANN, IITF issues, but how is it that internet governance? is the issue. So we really can't say that internet governance is just the technical parameters, then what it is is an is, uh, issue. 
Again, you know, this infrastructure is very important. I was reading a book of sociology in which we have heard of this insular Indian village, which used to provide everything within itself and never needed to, you know, connect to uh, further places. And how the coming of cycle, bicycle, coming of bicycle was the first change in the nature of social relationships of the city because some people started going from the from the village to the closed town and everything started changing. I'm just saying the early connectivity infrastructure is important. But nobody now focuses on either bicycle or railway tracks or roads, which are important still. If somebody closes the roads and railway tracks, we will stop. And if somebody asks you whether you can do without electricity or internet, you still will say, I need electricity more than internet. So I'm saying these things are really important, but people's attention shifts to higher levels. So, in the case of internet, what I'm saying is we right to, need to understand is internet only the technical infrastructure, protocols, or is something more? And if it's something more, who is looking at it? And, and there are some problems uh, with the risk if it is something more, then uh, whether adequate attention is being uh, paid to it. And whether we have shifted enough. You have read that book, uh, Who Moved My Cheese, right? So here the internet governance cheese has been moved, but the mouses are going to the same place still. So we need to send some of the mouses, mice, I know, to a different place where the cheese has been moved. So internet governance cheese has been moved. Uh, the early politics of internet was very clear. When they were making this connectivity infrastructure, they had two major governance points. One is connectivity, unhindered connectivity to everywhere. That's that's all. That's that's what the uh, technology's job is. That's, that's perfect. Across the boundaries, across people, free internet connectivity, free in the sense, unhindered connectivity to everybody. And keep governments away, because governments are typically those who want to come and control uh, control communication channels because they want to control how people organize, they want to control their access to information in many cases and such things. So there were two principal points which governed the politics of early internet governance. One is unhindered connectivity everywhere, free flow of connectivity, and second was uh, keep the governments away. Now I'll come back to these points because the kind of conditions in which we are today, digital trade and e-commerce, these two become problematic, and we have not, you know, negotiated uh, the paradoxes. Uh, early on, uh, it was invented in the U.S. Uh, we know that, but there were similar projects going on, in, for example, in France by Louis Cousin. Uh, but yes, it was that extraordinary culture of entrepreneurship in Silicon Valley and government support, uh, but also extent on freedom of information which got the internet as we have it today. Uh, however, there was another issue that internet was very early described as a global platform for e-commerce. The first policy framework around internet is the US framework for electronic e-commerce. So internet was basically e-commerce. Now that, that's a little problematic because for example, if internet was in a Nordic country, uh, they may have said that the first framework around internet is effective connecting of people and communities, you know. Community making is, is, is the policy framework, but because it was born in certain times during Clinton's new left, neoliberal rise, internet has become an e-commerce platform. And everything around internet is about e-commerce. These, these were the early fights, we know, you know, IT, ITU versus ICANN became the early fight. Now the problem is, and I'm going to quickly move on, because this is not an area I want to talk about. This area has been talked about here. We are stuck with some of these issues. ICANN versus ITU, ITU is governments, governments want to control the internet, which is quite true, uh, which is what we should keep away. And free interconnectivity across everywhere is, is the main policy objective. Now I'll come back how, how this has become a problem. You can already start thinking Uber and such, or Amazon, but I'll come there uh, in steps. I, I see three phases uh, of internet. 
what internet was. Early on, internet was simply uh, it was a network software. Before internet, softwares used to be on machines. They used to do certain work, and suddenly somebody came out with a protocol that I can connect all softwares and they talk to each other. And that's also internet is is a protocol. It's a software after all. It connects all softwares where they can talk to each other, they can find each other, and that's it. And the intelligence was supposed to be at the ends. This is a very, uh, very, very famous uh, thing which keeps on being repeated uh, for the early internet that. The network is dumb and the intelligence is on the ends, user ends, and, and that's what was the internet. And that's the early internet. And around that, the institutions of internet, ICANN, IETF, ISOC, etc., got shaped. Uh, and that's what the early politics of internet got shaped, shaped, which is the two principles connectivity to everyone, unhindered connectivity everywhere it should be able to flow uh, without any controls, and to keep the governments away. Now, around 2005, before that, but around 2005, it was becoming very evident that internet has become something else. And this was advent of huge application companies, starting with Google, but followed by Facebook. They're huge application companies, they're cloud computer companies, the client server architecture, where internet became kind of colonized by huge corporations which control a major part of it. And if, I mean, I, I know a statistics which is about six years back, we had like 75% of page views in the US were on the top 10 websites. I think it would be much fewer websites and a larger percentage uh, today perhaps. So we started to see huge applications which began to come and and control the network in a, in a way. They, they control it because they good, provided good services. Just connecting A to B and B doing his or her, her own work and A doing his or her own work was the original model, but there were people who said, no, we can come in the middle and provide you very useful services. And they were very useful services. And that's fine, I'm, I'm not against it, I'm just relating a history. So these huge application companies, that's a second phase, became what defined internet? And there are a lot of studies in many countries where if you ask kids what is internet, they don't know, but they know Facebook very well. And they use Facebook a lot, but they have not heard, they have not heard the word internet. They don't use that word. So you, you start to understand that in the second phase, a few companies became the internet in a huge, huge manner. Now what they were exercising is what is called as network power. Now one there is a network, and initially the network was supposed to be dumb, and it just provided connectivity between A and B, and A and B can do whatever they want to do. But in the middle now, we had huge companies which sat on the node and said, since connections go through us, we can, while we can improve the connections, Facebook, just rather than friends connecting with each other, organized that connectivity in a very sophisticated manner, which was very, very useful. And that's why people get up in the morning and see it first, because they provide a useful service. So they were sitting on the network saying, we can organize your connection better for you. But more and more people then enter into our world space as what the internet is. And they started to exercise the network power. Network power is simply that whoever sits on the nodes of the network is in a advantageous position to start making things to its own advantage. And there are stories, I don't have to go into it, how Google does it. Google is facing uh, anti-trust or uh, competition policies related regulation, regulatory action because it sends uh, search uh, traffic to its own companies. Facebook similarly does things in a manner in which rather than the two connectors benefit it benefits. I'm just saying this is called network power. People are able to get network power because they help organize the network better. You have to organize something better. You have to go and stand and do something for you to collect power. The thing they do is we'll organize the network better for you, but we'll therefore get power. And once the power is not regulated, they slowly start making the whole thing in a manner in which they get more and more power. And that's called network power. 
So there was this phase of network power and you know, EU for example was very worried. They started regulatory proceedings, they have been proceeding against platforms and so on. But well, they didn't do really much. They said, okay, you know, you, we don't want to uh, rock the boat. Uh, and the US of course was not interested because it was its company who were getting network powers and helping countries were always helpless because people wanted Facebook and they had no, uh, no leverage to do anything. This is known to you. This has been discussed a lot. And I could have a whole one hour on what network power is and its abuses, uh, but I'm going to go beyond it. This was the second phase. Its abuses are still talked about, but I'm going to go to the third phase, where we are today, which is the digital phase, which has not been talked about, but right now reorganizing everything around us, every single sector. Now, network power times organized largely information and communication related sectors. Google said, I am the organizer of, organizer of global power, uh, global knowledge. Facebook is the organizer of global relationships. And these are the two sectors they dominated. The sector which was closely kind of impacted was media. You have heard a lot of EU media, crime force, a lot of people, a lot of big publications have lost uh, their revenue streams and all that. And media was in deep shit because of this. But these were the areas. And people said, OK, this is a part of the problem. They are good services. They kept on waiting, and nobody did much. Now comes the digital phase. Now what happens in a digital phase is that those guys who are sitting on the nodes and exercising network power, and network power comes from tweaking networks, connectivities with one another to gain. And before I go to the digital age, the telecom guys realize that we provide the networks, and these guys exercise network power by tweaking who connects to whom. So why don't we exercise network power? Because after all, the physical network is ours. And they started what was the anti-net neutrality thing. They started this tired internet. To which Google's fought back. <laughs> Funny thing is, people want telecoms not to exercise network power, but nobody wants to speak about the network power which Google and Facebook uh, exercises. People started talking about algorithm neutrality, for example, uh, but these things don't go along because people are stuck in this old 90s formula, internet is good, telco is bad, internet is God, and rest is rest. So anyway, uh, so, so this was the network power, but the main regulatory issue in network power was regulating monopolies because monopolies sat at the nodes and exercised network power. And when Telco said we would exercise network power, network neutrality became the issue, and from that was derivative issues of algorithmic transparency, etc., to hit at the network powers. But if that was a problem, and people were still gasping at the enormity of the problem, which Google and Facebook provided, and now we move into the digital age. Now, in the digital age, what happens is that those people who are sitting on the network realize that the most powerful thing is not network power, which I've defined to you. The most powerful thing is data. And the digital intelligence which is built on data. I can just manipulate the connection between you two and make money, which was what network power was. But even more importantly, relax. Let me not do that. People interact on my digital platforms, get up in the morning, and the first thing they go and is to pick up their phone, up to the night, and all their activities, they leave digital traces of what they are, who they are, what they like, what they don't like. And this is the most important resource. Network power is not the most important resource. Data power is the most important resource. And once people realized, and it was almost, almost an act by an accident, Google, who was doing search engines and providing uh, people advertising space, because when they, people looked at search trees, they could look at the ad, and Google made money, started to realize that people who search for things, I know from the searches what they know, what they want, so I can you know, use the data to personalize advertisements, and that was the start. And then accidentally they realized that it's not the network power, but the data power which is important. So people just said, OK, don't care about the network power. Focus on data power. And once we started focusing on data power, we entered the digital age where we are today. This is the age of Ubers, Airbnb, Amazon. And Google and Facebook also became digital companies. Now, you should recognize the difference between network power and data power. And you should recognize the nature of internet pre-network power, which was, it was a decentralized end-to-end -end architecture. There are three different things altogether. 
they are un uncomparable, and we are stuck in the first phase. So, what companies started to do was that they started to use data power now, not only to organize information and communication sectors, but all sectors. You name it. Hotels, transportation, agriculture, finance, education. You have seen in the last three, four years, everything has changed from under your feet. And nobody wants to name that phenomenon. This name phenomenon is digitalization. At the center of it is data power. And the fabric which allows these kind of things to happen is still the internet. But we have moved to something else. The central resource is data and digital intelligence. And you have heard of artificial intelligence and people saying that they know everything about you. You know what all Uber knows about you. Uber even has access to the data on the, on the, the way the driver put on the pedal of the accelerator and the brake and judges the psychological condition of the driver at a particular condition. It is judging your psychological uh, conditions. It knows town traffic so well that they know that on Monday morning generally this happens and Thursday evenings and afternoon this happens. It knows when the game is going on, when the crowd will release. It knows everything and this is just very little. It's like 2% of what they know. Think of going at 80%. They are going to know everything about the transportation sector. <laughs> And when they know everything about the transportation sector, the real resource is not the fact that they're sitting on a network of drivers and commuters. The fact is that they're sitting on digital intelligence for the sector. They know everything about everyone and they make money out of it. It's like a brain versus a body. Your brain controls your body. The brain knows everything. And the brain has such control of the body that you're ready to perhaps, you know, give away every part of your body but not the brain. And brain can there, there is no terms of trade between brain and the body. Brain can make any terms of trade, because brain is brain. It's that kind of control Ubers and Airbnb have come up with. Now, I want to relax because I want to get you in into it. Do, what is this phenomena I'm talking about, and who's looking at its governance? Is it internet governance for you? Is regulation of data, data ownership, regulation of artificial intelligence, nature of digital intelligence, internet governance for you or not? What do you think? I need uh, some voices. Yes, no, yes. don't know. Yes. It is? It is. Has, have you heard anybody talk of it as internet governance? Is it, I may even say, perhaps a little more important today than the connectivity infrastructure over which this bits? This is internet governance, but nobody wants to talk about it. There are no, uh, no seminars on it, there is no policy documents on it, there is no policy meetings on it, uh, there are no organized organizations around it, there is no civil society advocacy around it. And I think this is like talking about big corporations and their power in industrial age versus talking about who made the roads and who lays the railway track and whether the railway track would be three feet or three and a half feet, which is very important because if it is one inch there or here, the railways will collapse and with that everything else will collapse. So I'm not saying that's not important, but I'm talking about the related importance about the superstructures of internet and nobody talks about it and whether that should be talked about. Now if you think that's internet governance, now we come to some problem areas because there are some works going around it, but some of that work doesn't relate to the two basic paradigms of early policy thinking which were unhindered connectivity to everyone and second, keep the governments away. And the problem is with, with these big data companies where data flows across globally and anybody can suck out data from your next Ola, uh, Uber trip and it goes to a server in the US where it has been collected, not just to make money out of this particular transaction, but in the next decades, over next decade, an intelligence has been collected about the Indian transportation system and about you as an individual and that will be monetized bit by bit Forever. Forever. You cannot disconnect it. And you can't say, I'm not going to take the service because it is so efficient, because the fact that they know it about you more than you know about it, that you yourself go and say, sorry, I don't like it, but please serve me. I want to have your service rather than uh, some local taxi guy who's like, kind of screwed up. So, if, you know, the problem is that this, you heard of free flow of data, you know. The same guys who talked about Free flow of connectivity, which is good, safe 
free flow of data is also good because free flow of connectivity is good. But there's a problem there because free flow of data means somebody is collecting data about you and it is gathering longer and it's going to be used for economic, social, political, and cultural exploitation over years. But the people who are associated with early internet governance paradigm cannot disassociate from the fact that, of course, uh, free flow of data is good. Because free flow of internet is good, free flow of connectivity is good. So a lot of work now is going on into, there is something called e-commerce negotiations going on at World Trade Organization. It's meeting in December in Argentina. Is one of the biggest issues is free flow of data. The regional comprehensive economic partnership, which is ASEAN plus India, China, Australia, Korea, New Zealand, and Japan, who are right now in Seoul, as we talk here, discussing e-commerce and free flow of data. And people who were initially associated with internet co governance and did that heroic work of not only inventing, like IETF kind of people who made this protocol, but like ISOCs, who actually went from country to country and established against great resistance the first internets are, if I may be allowed to say, stuck with that thinking and saying, oh, I can only understand that free flow should be good. The problem is that most of civil society organizations in WTO and in RCEF who are from developing countries are arguing, no, we don't want free flow of data. We want controls over data as a people's resource which works for people's interest and for that purpose there's only one way to go, the government makes regulation because I'm not going to be able to fight with Google or not you are not going to be fight with Google and this is simple elementary proposition. So governments need to get in, control the issue of ownership of data and then I mean quickly I can talk about this Aadhaar thing, I know I have myself a lot of problems with Aadhaar, these privacy guys. Privacy guys would simply say, data is toxic, just don't gather it. And the next thing they will do is use their Facebook while sitting in Uber, uh, you know, and going for a meeting, which itself would be one, uh, one such, uh, such use of uh, data. Now, you know, data cannot be toxic and daily and continually you will be not deriving economic value out of it. So get real. Either you give up a driving economic value of data, or agree that data needs to be collected by somebody and its value be developed out of it, which is digital intelligence, which at one level becomes artificial intelligence. You know things artificial intelligence is doing. I mean, every day you hear them, you like gasp. They can see a picture and tell whether you are gay or straight. You heard that two weeks back. But by next week, it will be something even more uh, you know, outrageous. It just tells you that this thing is going to take over everything. And we want to talk about the, whether the railway tracks should be two and a half feet or three feet, which is important as I say. The problem is that we need to move on and say who is going to talk about these things. And I'm happy if this is not internet governance, then we can put it aside and give a name to that. Is it digital governance? That's fine with me. Let's, let's make that thing as digital governance, develop parameters, communities around it, get policy discussions about it, but beware, if it is digital governance and not internet governance, then you suddenly will find that out of 3,000 people who come to internet governance, only 200 will come, and 2,800 will go to the digital governance forum. So, I, I think there, there are those paradoxes which need to be worked out. There are certain, you know, stilted ways of thinking and institutional structures which are not opening up enough to do that. All of them. I, I mean, Every government structure does it. I mean, that's the very nature of government structure. And the outsiders are supposed to talk back to power and say, no, well, this is changed. So, so now uh, I've got about 15 minutes. I'll, I'll conclude and then take some questions. And then, depending on the kind of questions, I'll keep on going. Uh, so now, what has happened is that uh, I work with many internet governance groups who are not able to understand how should we oppose free flow of data. And I work with many farmers groups, fishermen groups, hawkers groups, to small businesses groups, to name them. I mean, like hundreds of these people who go to World Trade Organization talks about what is changing in the economy. And they say, no, relax. It's hitting the economy so much that I need protections. And then we, we tend to think in internet governance, 
there is a community, people have the same you know, interest and everybody goes and works together. That's not true because their people have different interests. And these groups who are traditionally the civil society groups are at WTO, are at RCEP opposing free flow of data, which doesn't match with the typical internet governance advocacy. So these paradoxes or contradictions are not being sorted out. And as we can keep on behaving, they are not there, close our eyes, but you know, the tides of history has fo have force which will then sweep things which don't change fast enough. So, and, and I'm also working, apart from on e-commerce area, this is about the new venues. Right now, right now again, in this week, the Human Rights Council working group is talking about a binding treaty on human rights and transnational corporations, to which our coalition submitted a chapter on digital corporations, uh, which operate in a transnational manner, in which a Ghana or a Bangladesh had no leverage. You would have heard, uh, you know, the way Russia is supposed to have manipulated the elections of the US. Right? You know that? Yeah. The margins were so low that probably Hilton, uh, 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 Hillary Clinton would actually have been the president, if that would not have happened. Not that I'm a great fan of Hillary Clinton either, but Trump is positively evil, as you know. Uh, a country's democracy has rigged. One year back, I'm in a working group where I was trying to convince governments that get up, start doing internet policies. And I, finally, because I knew what makes them politically you know, sensitive, I said, okay, leave everything else. One issue, elections, is going to make you, and this is a precise situation, I said, you guys, when you suddenly find your elections rigged, that day you want, would want the UN Security Council to meet today. And then you will think, why didn't I work on institution much earlier, which is that working group working on institution uh, for? Now, guys, are you waiting for that to happen to India after you start talking about it? No. Is there any reason it wouldn't happen in India? Can you give me one reason it won't happen in India? It will happen in India. It will happen in Ghana, it will happen in the Philippines, it will happen in Indonesia. It will happen. So you guys are waiting to have it happen as a, oh, well, this is unacceptable. What is unacceptable is the fact that you guys are waiting for it to happen. You guys are not ready to talk about issues in internet governance which are most important. Today, after what happened, the Congress has come out with Honest Ads Act, which says that Facebook will have to tell all details about political and legislature related ads which are made on it. Facebook will tell it to the US, but let India make a law like that, and Facebook is saying, well, actually Facebook and Google went to the court and said, we are not the companies you are talking about. We are simply advertisement reseller companies. The Facebook is in the US, go and talk to it, and you can't. So India can make an act. I hope that really tickles your you know, concerns that an election is going to be rigged because of uncontrolled internet companies. And that's still the network power and of course the digital power because they manipulate people around it. So my issue is that there is something called digital governance. Network power is not the most important thing. We are in periods of data governance. China actually has policy papers in which it clearly recognizes that software layer is not the important layer. They, knew, no, they know the software layer belongs to India. He said, you can take it. They say data layer is the important thing. And the way China is managing data, i tell you one thing, and I'll just close it with that. Because data is the most important thing, US manages data by its free market economy. Weak privacy regulations, they're shady markets, people buy and sell data, and there's a market of it. And that is the number one digital power in the world. China has a strange manner. There are no rules. So when uh, a state of Guizhou, there is a company who wanted training data for its visual identification artificial intelligence application, the state gave its citizen photographs to it. So take it. That's happened regularly. There was a conference in which uh, the government was giving health data to make health applications. And that's working for them. That's a problem because they have no rules about data around them. One side is a free market which uses global domination to make it's a number one company, number one digital power. Other side, there are no rules. They use government power to make yourself. Countries like India, who are a mixed economy, rules-based economy, can't do either what China is doing or what US has done. We need a rule-based system. So we need governments, for example, to get into what is called public data infrastructures, on which I'm doing a paper. I can't get into it again in a long discussion. Aadhaar's United Unified Payment Interface, 
they are making a concerned infrastructure. You heard India's track, right? Those are the kind of things which India is pioneering. The basically, we need to start talking about data governance, data regulation. We are in a digital age. I don't know whether this is internet governance or not. If it is not, we need to orient ourselves towards it. I will take some questions and some other points to make. And if there are not too many questions, then I will go on to them. Excuse me, sir. Sir, you are creating a very scary scenario, but it is going to become a reality. So how is the civil society... My dear. Hello. Hello. Uh, you, you are projecting a very scary picture. So, I mean, uh, we as a civil society, what should be our take and how we should uh, look forward? Uh, any more questions? I'll take two or three and then go. Uh, why we are not able to substitute Sahir? Who? Yeah. Sahir? Yeah. Why we are not able to substitute Google or Can Facebook? Can you raise your hand who is speaking? Sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. Oh, sorry. Okay. Why we are not able to substitute Google or Facebook with uh, uh, Indian websites? Okay, I'll take these two. Uh, uh, sir, here. Okay, three. Uh, it, it's an action. Uh, oh, it, it, it's Indian. My question is, uh, is the uh, multi-stakeholder uh, model uh, in Indian governance actually helping uh, the developing countries like India, because we are uh, saying uh, no border, uh, equal uh, rights to actually uh, Facebook. I mean, committing with Facebook uh, a small player, there is no chance. So, uh, you know, I mean, uh, you, you have mentioned the country China, but uh, their their model is something I think uh, something different. So, are we the multi stakeholder yeah. model really helping helping? Uh, yeah, so your question was on creating uh, connected uh, connections. Scary. I think I should get special remuneration for you know creating scary <laughs> scenarios for which you you have to waste a lot of yourself, right? You can do bad things. So like uh, sanitation workers, I should get a special. Um, you know. Um, anyway, yeah, that's it. Uh, the rule is, of course, to see. I think one thing I should tell you, when I'm pretty scary, I mean, my, my organization name is IT for Change. We, of course, very don't go on IT, right? This is IT for Change. There's no way to go back. Uber and Ola are so efficient reorganizers of transportation system, we can't go back to old taxis. Same with what Amazon and uh, Flipkart are doing. Small things, getting your milk supplies from going to gym to everything will be transformed because digital intelligence is going to transform. It's like, again, you know, the diet thing. Okay, if it wasn't working, let go back to our, uh, whatever, those weaving machines, right? It doesn't work. So it has to be, digital intelligence has to be used. Now, either digital intelligence can, and digital intelligence, the problem is, cannot be used in small distributed manners. You can't have your own digital intelligence and you have your own digital intelligence because data becomes digital intelligence when a huge amount of it gets together, right? So you have that strong, solid, centralized organization. It's very funny that internet started by saying that intelligence would only reside at the ends and right now all intelligence resides in the middle. And these kind of things have to be taken notice of, not just as rhetorics, but actually said on that the whole thing has changed. Jesus is completely moved. So civil society has to, you know, start saying that how we can use digital intelligence in a manner in which few corporates belong to the US and some now are from China. And you know the kind of China present. PTM is China. Flipkart has a lot of Chinese money. You know the kind of Chinese investments are coming up. They're very careful because they don't want you to see it, it happening in that manner. So the question is that first of all, sir, you just have to ask the question. That's the point. And ask it often enough. So that's the point. If you ask the question, we will start talking about MAPs. I mean, as about and things will come out. My answer is, and I'm again doing a paper for Commonwealth uh, London on it, that digital infrastructures, like industrial infrastructures, initially roads were private, trains were private. So the guy who owned a factory used to have its own railway track. He said only my stuff would go on this railway track is a private railway track. And governments realized that's not going to work. Same with electricity. You had private electricity, and then said all infrastructures, electricity, transportation has to be public or a utility, and on the top of it, businesses would work. So the whole of core sectoral data should be a public infrastructure on the top of which businesses can work. And government of India is starting to do, do things which are extraordinarily great. So they don't have a policy and programmatic vision. They're doing it by fits and starts, but they're doing things. Why can't India do Google is uh, 
that uh, we need to regulate network power and data power. Uh, sir, I'm answering your question. Uh, when data power and network power were two powers I, I described. Both are monopoly powers. Whoever gets it becomes too strong. And you have to regulate and break it down. You know how we talk so much about unregulated internet? What started internet? What started telecom regulation was regulatory intervention on Marble, which was broken into many telecom companies. Government came and broke that company, and that's what started telecom regulation. Revolution. Software revolution was born when government came and said software cannot be bundled with hardware. And IBM and all were forced to unbundle software and hardware. And the combination of telecommunication and software revolution is the internet revolution, which again was born in defense labs. But both were huge regulatory interventions which made this possible. If it was not done, we would not have been here. But suddenly we have been told to believe that governments are bad, don't get regulation. So these are the questions. And again, it's not one or the either. Then you become China, because China is not the way we want to work, uh, where the government has you know, ad hoc power to do whatever. You know, They don't like Uber, they start supporting Didi, and the Uber is kicked out. And then when they like Didi's opponent, they do. so we don't want to do it. We want to do it rule-based things. So civil society guys would need to get into uh, discussing that. And first, I agree that this is, if not this is a main internet governance, this is a very important part of internet governance, which is not how it is seen today. Anybody else? Yeah. One question. As you said, uh, uh, that keep away governments from the internet, you know, because they wanted to control it, or they want, the governments want to control the internet. But the governments are also an important stakeholder in the global IG process. So why do you think that governments are not uh, the one who can be a transparent stakeholder? Second, when you know that the government funds you know, many organizations, directly or indirectly, to carry on the engagements and IG processes. So what's your take on that? Okay, so I have a related question. So uh, we have seen recently the uh, the data breaches on other, even though government doesn't agree that there were breaches, but we have seen the geo data being breached on online. So, should the data protection or policies initially start from the government itself rather than asking Facebook or Google to implement? Should the policy or the implementation should start from the government itself, considering the fact that the government now has biometric data of almost 10 million people, more than 100 million people? <laughs> All the stakeholder questions, I don't know. See, I, I don't want to get into the stakeholder discussion. Many people have heard me talk about it. I think. First of all, government is not a stakeholder for me, actually, you know. You know what a stakeholder is? Stakeholder has its own interest, and I have my own interest. I hold a fight with government to say that you are supposed to represent my interest. But that's a philosophical question in their mind. But, I mean, government is a representative, it's not a stakeholder. But anyway, I think there are problems when stakeholder mechanisms want to make policies. You wouldn't want education policy to be made by Pearson and all to sitting together and say they will make education policy or pharma companies to be sitting and saying we have a veto over health policies of the country, right? So I don't see why a corporation could have veto over uh, internet policies. If health is less important than internet, or less basic, or even less, people say all these things like, you know, it's a bottom-up thing. What is, what is bottom-up? Health is not bottom-up. Is trade not bottom-up? People started trading things with each other long before there was a centralized method. If I give something to you, what business is of government to come in? But they come in. What is more bottom-up than trade? Or health? Health practices are my personal things. I go to a doctor and I take something from you. Government says, no, no, you can't go to him because he's not a doctor. I mean, so, so all these are, you know, these are, these are uh, ideologies. Which we, I mean, there was very important because right now when the internet was created, there was a problem that the biggest obstacle was the state, which did not want to give over communication power over the communication <laughs> systems. And very heroically over a decade and a half, all these institutions fought and gave us this magical thing like internet. I, for a moment, don't deny that. But as I said, the cheese has moved. Yeah, governments can do whatever they want to do. It's up to me and you to fight and get the governments in to do it. Governments, everybody does what they would like to do unless somebody else pressurizes it. So this is your job in a government, democratic government. It's the same about health policies and education policy. Every where they screw up, but we try to get them do it well, rather than saying that pharma companies who are also producers of medicines as internet companies are producers of internet availability. 
so these, these are the questions. Yeah, I don't know. See, it's like who has more power has to be controlled. And sometimes governments have more power and we fight against the governments. And I, I work with RTI groups. We work all the time on the roads protesting, you know, how lands have been taken by farmers and all that. When you have to protest against the governments, you protest against the governments. When you have to protest against the corporations, you protest against the corporations. When you're doing one, don't ask the other questions because that's the best way not to do anything. Every point you have to see who is more powerful and who has to be then pulled back and often you use the power of the other side to pull that back. So that's the difference. Of course, the government, you are really, you are reciting so many leaks from Aadhaar which are of lesser order than the leaks which have happened globally from private databases. This is a fact, you'd agree or not? Yeah. That's it. So, facts are always there. Which facts I choose and put a, make a picture and hang on my wall is the question. The choice is the question of that facts. So all facts are important, uh, but we need to confront power where it centralizes. And right now, digital power and internet power is centralized with corporations, and you need to break that. And keep on doing the other fight as well. Yeah, Probably two more questions and then As the data power is go growing, and uh, these IT gems are uh, using the AI concepts, they are tracking each and every concept of a person. Then, as the technology grows, somebody says that as the technology grows, it will become hazards for the human life, right? What would become a hazard? Like, uh, life threatening, you can say. Whether industry, big machines were also supposed to be life threatening, they are. Uh, more threatening I have machines. one. Uh, but yeah, we've been. Survey paper scenario uh, with you. One woman in a Gujarat has a, using a Facebook application and they use the, with the auto synchronization thing, uh, all her personal photos will be uploaded with the Facebook and she got. Yeah, I can see there are lots of this. I'm not cutting you short, but there are huge amount of daily newspaper items of all these things. Yes. So, what's your question? Question is, uh, means how there will be a, some mind power which is growing. We have willing power to control the mind things. Like that, can we control the data which is growing? I don't know. You tell me, I, you have a way. I only know the regulation has controlled everything in the See, world yeah. who becomes too powerful. Simply, everybody is generating a data so that we can restrict the data so that. Who? We means who? I mean, let's be very practical. Every user of the... Are you going to do that? Is you? Are you seeing your friends going to do that? Let's be practical because we are dealing with people's lives here, uh, people's economic advantage. China and US becoming digital powers. India is going down. People are dying on the roads because of lower economic growth. So we are talking real stuff. So you are saying we should do it somehow it will happen. No, that's not uh, the substance of serious policy discourse. You think you are doing it? Are you ready to do for two days? No, I mean, some guidance will be there and uh, no, I'm not, see, I, I'm not trying to be confront, confronting you in this manner. I'm saying that it doesn't happen. See, people, it's like, I, I mean, education policy. People keep on saying schools are wrong in this, this manner, but send the kids to the same school. A collective decision has to be taken collectively. Individuals cannot take collective decisions. These are social policy choice questions on which books are written. That I would act immediately as per my small benefit as long as I'm not breaking the law. Everybody would do it. So then do think that 1.5 billion people would, or some of them would start doing it. People do it. I use open source software. Some of you do it. These, these things don't really make the material of an economy. Right? The material of economy is a contest between big powers. And big powers is a corporate power which has to be confronted by the regulatory power. So, at least we can make applications or anything which cannot access our personal life. No, we can't make applications. If your answer is that there are technical solutions, no. I, I, I like, I know, you know, we have this uh, dream that technology could solve um, most of the social uh, issues, no, they can't. They can't solve security issues. We are willing to uh, give the permissions to that applications. Then also we. Uh, of course, you you can do it. You can not give a permission by not using that application, my dear. But the fact is, you want to use the application. The so Facebook, if you do use that technology, will cut you off it, and then you want to go to the Facebook. That's the problem. Yeah, please. Inujit from Kolkata. Do you believe that uh, any regulation can stop technological advances? This is uh, this you know high level question. Are people good? Are they? They good and bad. 
The regulation has most of them are most of them are. So this is when you come the most uh, much of uh, advances. Why should somebody want to stop somebody's advance? Now this is a problem because you have already in your mind thought that. Uh, governments are against advance, and I gave you three examples just now. The telecommunication revolution took place because of marble regulation. Software revolution took place because of software unbundling regulation. Internet was born in defense labs, but you still want to say governments stop technology progress. So I can't do with those settled mindsets because that's not a fact. Why should they want to stop it? Yes, bad regulation can come in the way of uh, technology progress, as it can come in the way of education, as it come in the way of economic growth. We know that economic growth, we always are fighting whether good regulation, bad regulation, how much regulation in economic growth. Regulation, I mean, these are really fundamental questions. Bad regulation, yes, good regulation advances technologies. Last two, I think uh, I can see the uneasiness on the part of the organizers. So these are the two next questions. Okay, I'll just take a short question. I need a clarity on, um, Digital intelligence governance with respect to who is having the final control over the final decision on the rules and scope of any new digital technology coming in picture, for example, AI or VI. Um, and how much role do a civil uh, uh, civil society or a civil member play in the final implementation? What comes in picture? Okay, quickly because then I can go. No, I mean I'm not saying digital intelligence exists. I'm saying it doesn't exist. So you ask me a question. What is digital intelligence? My whole point is the conception doesn't exist. We would the uh, facts and implementation of it exist. So if I tell anything is there, who is trying to take control of it? Is it no one is trying to take control of it. Control of people. people are not discussing it because the people who are owning the data don't want us to... These words data ownership is not put together because they don't want us to discuss data regulation and data ownership. They say, you know, let's talk about this mother and apple pie things. So they don't want you to talk about it. You need to start talking about it, and one day there will be a good regulation. So there's no regulation right now. Last one. Yeah, hi. Uh, you know, uh, thanks, you, know, uh, you opened up a new dimension to you know, the internet governance forum that right now we are having. Uh, internet governance, it, it addresses only the network channels, so that's why you know, I think uh, it is internet. Uh, governance. It's like about networks, okay, and not about on you know completely about data dimension. So I I believe like you know uh, digital governance need to be there uh, rather than of you know uh, or otherwise internet governance has to be enabled or you know to grow up to the next level uh, to address the data part of it. You know so otherwise you know it would be like yeah there are data is there network is there and we are also internet governance also discussing about that but it's in a light lighter manner like not in in terms of like in a digital fashion, like whatever that we are talking about, the like Airbnb kind of, you know, that level. It's like, you know, very, very lower, lower level. Like, you know, they are, there are data is like, you know, country uh, level, you know, TLD and, you know, GTLD and all that. That is also a kind of a data that controls about the, which country can access the network, so kind of, you know. So, uh, I believe like, yeah, you opened up a new dimension and thanks to that, and, you know, we got enlightened on that part, yeah. So it's an observation and I agree with it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much for the very interactive.